Welcome to this week's weekly webinar. My name is Molly Keck and I am an Integrated Pest Management Program Specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service and I'm also a board certified entomologist. This week we're going to be talking venomous spiders. If you're watching us in real time, then this is the week of Halloween. And so many of us are seeing some creepy crawlies as decorations. You might be thinking about things that are a little bit scary and maybe you're wondering which of those spiders actually can hurt us. You might be surprised to know that there are only 30 spiders in the entire world that are actually medically harmful or of medical concern to humans. And of those, there's only two types of spiders in the U.S. that are harmful. Those include the widows and the recluses. And as we go through this presentation, you'll learn that there are multiple species of widows and recluses. And so that's why I'm grouping them together and saying just two types. But there are multiple species that can be harmful. Every other spider is technically in the world of science considered to be beneficial. So when you see spiders that are outside in your garden, be thankful that they're there. They are a good thing to have, even though spiders in your house are doing something good by reducing and helping control the insect population. Recluse spiders are also called fiddleback, or sometimes they're called reapers or violin spiders. So if you look at their uh, cephalothorax region, you'll see that they have what appears to be a violin or a fiddle shape. These guys are all in the genus Lo Lo Loxoskeles, and there are different species of recluse spiders. So when you say brown recluse, you're really only talking about one species of that spider. You can see here from this map that there are one, two, three, four, five, six species of recluse spiders. The brown recluse is, is uh, the reclusa species, so that's the red coloring. And so if you're in San Antonio, you may or may not, we may or may not technically have reclusa spiders. We probably have the devia species. Um, if you're in West Texas, you have a couple different species, maybe even three different species. We have Apachia, Blonda, and reclusa over in the western part of the region. But you can see there's other species that we don't even have within Texas. So um, worldwide or nationwide, I should say, we don't have brown recluse everywhere, but they are in a good portion of kind of, uh, they're all throughout Texas at the very least. So when you look at a brown recluse spider, what you will see is that they have long skinny legs that um, allows the body to only be about half an inch long, maybe three eighths of an inch. But even with their legs stretched out, they're really barely the size of a quarter. So when people contact me and say that they found something that's the size of a coaster, it can't be a brown recluse. Brown recluse are actually very dainty, small spiders. Under the microscope, you can see that they have lots of hairs that cover their body, including their legs, and they're also brown in coloration. The two characteristics that usually tell you you have a brown recluse is to see that fiddle or violin on the back, but there are other species of spiders that look to resemble that and look like they have fiddles on their back, so that is not the best way to identify them. Instead, the only tried tried and true way to identify a brown recluse or a recluse spider is to look at how the eyes are arranged. Recluse spiders have six eyes that are arranged in three pairs. So they're paired up, three sets of pairs, making six total eyes. Spiders that look to have a fiddle on the back but aren't true recluse species will not have this arrangement of the eyes. The adults brown recluse live for a pretty good long time. They can live up to um, two years, which is a very long life for an arachnid or for just a small animal in general. They lay about 50 eggs around the time of May and August, and then those spiderlings emerge within a month. So, um, you know, June through September is when the babies are hatching out. One female can produce up to five egg sacs in a lifetime, so while about 50 eggs isn't really that much, she produces quite a few of those within her life. And it takes them about a year um, to go from uh, egg to adult and being able to reproduce themselves. So they have a very long and slow life cycle, and they are very well adapted to living indoors with people. So as they produce those egg sacs and make more and more and more babies, their populations can rise pretty large. 
They prefer to scavenge over hunting, actively hunting for food. So they will eat live food, but they are one of the unique spiders that will feed on things that are already dead as well. They are fairly nocturnal. So during the day they're tucked away and they're hiding away from you and they don't produce webs. So it, you can't focus and target a web to try to control them. You actually have to figure out where it is that they are hiding from you. Recluse spiders don't do something called ballooning. Ballooning is when the babies, uh, the spiderlings, um, re make a silk strand that um, comes out of their spinnerets and they allow the wind to carry them to another location. So they're able to spread pretty far. Instead, they spread very slowly, which is one reason why we probably see them only in certain areas within the United States. They're not cosmopolitan and throughout the United States. But because their spread is slow, their populations are allowed to build up pretty rapidly in one location because they're not moving away from that location. So they're just one family that becomes many families over time. They are very well adapted to living indoors with us. And so they're pretty much found virtually any spot in your house or in some sort of a structure that's dark or undisturbed. The bite of a recluse spider um, is the venom is a cytotoxin. And so that causes necrosis of the tissue. It rarely is carried into the bloodstream. So it's usually a localized infection or localized damage. And the actual damage that occurs really depends on the amount of venom that you receive, your allergy level to them, your overall health. There's a lot of factors that are involved. It also depends on the spot where you're bitten. So if you're bitten on a spot like say your wrist or your ankle where there really isn't a lot of tissue, the damage may not be very bad. But if you were to be bitten on your back, on a leg, on your thigh, on your rear end, then you probably would have more substantial scarring or damage because there's a lot more tissue for that venom to get into. Most people that are bitten by recluse spiders will heal completely without any scarring and that, and that usually will happen within a few weeks. Most people are bitten when you touch them first. They are not an actively threatening type of a spider that's going to seek you out and try to bite you. Instead, you slip on clothes, you put on shoes, you sit down on one, you brush against it, and they react and defend themselves by biting. It's really, really difficult to diagnose a true recluse bite versus other types of bites. So in this picture here, you can see that the wound on the left is actually from a recluse spider and the wound on the right is from a bacterial infection. So pustules or necroses of the tissue doesn't necessarily mean that it was a recluse that did it. And also rarely does the bite initially hurt. You re very few people realize that they were bitten by a recluse. Instead, you react to it later on. And so it's very difficult to put two and two together and determine that, that a certain infection or um, necrosis of the tissue is actually caused by a spider if there wasn't actual evidence that the spider bit you. Again, the initial bite is not very painful. It generally goes unnoticed. It's because you brushed up against them. You don't realize that they're even there. First symptoms will generally start about two to six hours after the bite, and it starts with itching, swelling, some redness, discomfort, kind of like what happens with um, mosquito bites or other insect bites. A whitish area might surround the red area where they did bite, and generally a blister forms, a small little pimple-like formation will form that takes a long time to heal oftentimes. Some people might be accompanied with a fever, chills, dizziness, and generally it's very localized. It's going to it's going to heal within a few weeks. It is almost never going to be deadly. That is going to be because it somehow got into the bloodstream or you had some sort of a secondary infection that occurred. But what generally is the the worst result from a recluse spider bite is that you do have some sort of scarring or if they bite you on the tip of a finger, maybe the tip of the finger has to be removed. Where you find recluse spiders in nature is just in debris, under stuff, places you find scorpions, places you're kind of afraid to stick your hand. So in nature, they're found in debris, under wood piles, under logs, under rocks, dark, secluded places that are rarely disturbed where people aren't turning the rocks over often, where logs are piled up or firewood happens to be piled up. 
They've also adapted extremely well to living indoors. And where you find them indoors is in spots where we have lots and lots of clutter. So barns, because you're not going in there very, very often, storage sheds, garages, attics, basements, closets that are extremely cluttered, crawl spaces, cellars, if you happen to have something like that, um, ductwork, places that are kind of um, worrisome if you were to crawl into them. Storage boxes inside of closets are a good place that they might hide. They like to hide inside shoes. They might be found in clothing, so your coat closet would be a good place for them to be in. Folded linens, behind furniture. Just think of any place that is dark and undisturbed. A closet that looks like this with lots of stuff that just keeps piling up and piling up and isn't is sitting on the ground, Isn't things are not lifted up off of the ground, that is kind of a haven for a brown recluse to be hanging out. The other thing that will allow brown recluse to become pretty active is um, during times of the year when we have lots of decorations. So this is usually the holiday season, Halloween, Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, Christmas. We go up in the attic and we take our decorations down and these kind of dried, uh, flower arrangements, um, wreaths, Christmas trees, things, these kinds of decorations that you see are wonderful places for brown recluse, recluse spiders to be hiding and hanging out. So you'd go up in the attic, they have found this as a nice mansion to live in, you take it down into your home and then that's generally how you can spread them from place to place. Also moving, um, taking things out of the attic and moving to a new home, giving it to somebody else, that's another way that we will spread the, brown, the recluse spiders from location to location. Schools are notorious for having problems with recluse spiders and usually it does happen over the holidays because the teachers are bringing items from their home. But also a school doesn't have the proper storage for all of the items that teachers use to teach. So just the way that things are, schools in general are fairly cluttered because there's lots of um, props, there's lots of supplies, lots of materials that are required to teach our children. And so if you look at a typical teacher's classroom like this, just in their corner where their desk is, there's lots of places where a recluse spider could be hanging out and hiding. Now let's pretend like this is your home. This looks to be a relatively uncluttered, very clean, very nice home, but there are some spots where I would look to try to find those recluse spiders. First of all, I would look behind all sorts of furniture. That furniture is shoved up against the wall and so they might be hiding behind there. They also might be hiding underneath. I would look behind also the where the TV is and the TV stand because that spot is warmer and so a lot of times that will attract insects and spiders to it because of the warmth. Just what's given off from the electricity. Generally you have some sort of a, um, a plug or extension cord, something like that that's generating a little bit more heat. Underneath couches, underneath chairs, especially if they have some sort of skirting that touches the floor. Also flip that couch upside down and see if they're tucked up underneath and in the batting of the couch. I would look around um, knickknacks, books, places like that, just where, you know, this is not a cluttered room by any means, but that is the cluttered spot of this room. Also in the folds and tufts of fabric, such as curtains, if they're not opened and closed often, um, if it's stationary, something like that, then that's a good place for those guys to be hanging out. So you can see there's lots of spots and there are many more than this that you could find recluse spiders hanging out in a room such as this. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a very cluttered room, but the more cluttered your space is, the more likely they are to hide. Um, and if you notice that you have a recluse spider, then you want to definitely try to declutter and minimize in that space until you get them under control. If you find the unfortunate event that you have a recluse spider infestation, it is almost impossible to go and figure out what the cause was that brought them in. You probably brought in a box. You had um, luggage that was up in the attic that they were found in. You purchased something at a garage sale. I mean, really the options are, are pretty endless. 
So instead of worrying about how you got them, just worry about how to control them. And you have to remember that patience is truly a virtue, especially in controlling recluse spiders, because it can be a very long process because they're so reclusive. So prevention is always better than management. And so if you have had them before, you worry about getting them, then do things to keep them from their natural habitat coming inside. So use window screens, make sure your door sweeps work well, seal up cracks and crevices. They are attracted to insects and so converting for, to yellow light so they're not attracted to insects that come to bright white lights can help as well. And then try to store your items in either bags or Tupperware containers, something that's sealed nice and tight so they can't go into those storage bins. Remove additional trash, get rid of debris, eliminate clutter, remove dead insects that they might be feeding on. And if you can, don't allow things to pile up on a closet floor. Try to raise that stuff up off of the floor and, and kind of tuck it away neater as opposed to in a, kind of in shambles, in a bundle. Sticky traps or glue boards are an excellent way to both monitor and reduce uh, recluse spider populations. Generally, what you're going to catch a lot on those glue boards are males that are seeking out females. And that's fine. If you don't have a male to mate with a female, then the female can't produce egg sacs. It's good to use these prior to pesticides, but I would also continue to use them during the use of pesticides so that you can continue to monitor and figure out what are the spots where I'm finding recluse spiders and is what my pest control company did or what I did working. If you see less and less over time on those sticky boards or those glue traps, then obviously you're doing a good job. Vacuum constantly, vacuum up spiders that you see, vacuum up egg sacs that you happen to find, vacuum up dead insects, vacuum, vacuum so that you can just physically remove them from the area. Use a fly swatter. When you see them crawling around, kill them. Don't allow them to go scuttle away and hide under something. You wanna kill those that are active that you're able to spot. Most of the time you will not control recluse spiders with one single treatment. Sometimes that is absolutely possible, but for the most part, you should anticipate so that you don't become disappointed, anticipate that you'll have to have a call back from your pest management company. If you're doing it yourself, you certainly are gonna have to do it more than once because you just don't have access to the right technology, equipment, and products. So sanitation and decluttering is essential. If you're working with a pest management company, help them out by decluttering and sanitizing and cleaning up so that the recluse spiders are easier for them to attack and to treat. If you continue to have clutter, then whatever they use is not going to make its way to the spiders. So don't rely completely on pesticide use. You want to also use sanitation, some cultural control practices. Elevate items off of the floor. That way, your pest management company can come in and treat along baseboards and spots where the spiders are much easier. Make sure to remember to clean and sweep and vacuum periodically so that you're sweeping up egg sacs, you're sweeping up those um, spiders that you might find. You're just keeping things cleaner so that they don't find food sources and you're physically removing them. When you're using pesticides, there's a couple different options to use. Because they're not found in nests or in webs, you kind of have to treat the areas where you think they're hiding. This is one reason why, in my opinion, I think using a good pest management company is a great option for you, and oftentimes a cheaper option, because they have the knowledge and know-how to figure out where those spots might be. Dusts can be effective. You wanna dust very, very lightly so that you don't even see the dust. You're doing this along sills, rafters, under insulation, behind light switches and plates. It's a good idea to use an apparatus called a duster so that you get a fine application. This again is where using a pest management company might be cheaper than purchasing these items yourself. The types of active ingredients to look for are generally your um, synthetic pyrethroids, delta methrin, delta dust, Cyfluthrin is Tempo, and then even Silica Aerogels, Tri-Dye, which is going to dry out the spiders, so it's a slower death, but as long as that Silica Aerogel is still active, then any kind of insect or arachnid or arthropod that comes in contact with it will um, be on the decline because it has come in contact with it. 
Liquid pesticides in addition to dusts are also good ideas. These also will be your synthetic pyrethroids, things that end in thrin, cyfluthrin, bifenthrin, deltamethrin, lambda cyhalothrin, and you're using these in areas where they find harborage. These will have a little bit of a residual, so will the dust as well, um, but what you're hoping is that they crawl across it, they come in contact with it, they get sick, and they die. The second type of medically harmful spider that we have in the state of Texas are the widow spiders. And these are the Lactrodectus species. So there are multiple species of widow spiders. We have about three throughout the state of Texas. If you're found um, north of Texas, you have some other species. Our probably most common type of widow spider is called the southern black widow spider or very commonly called just the plain black widow. This one is also called a shoe button spider for some reason. These are about an inch in size or so. They um, have an hourglass on their rear end on the underside of their abdomen and you also notice that they have some other little red markings kind of at the tip of their abdomen as well. The western black widow is found along Texas and the states above it and to the west. And this one is also black. It has an hourglass, but doesn't necessarily have the other markings um, at their tip of the abdomen. And then an invasive species of widow spider called the brown widow spider is also found throughout Texas and throughout a large part of the United States. This is um, a brown color with some black markings on it, but again, still has the hourglass underneath it. It's actually, if you ever see them uh, in real life, they're actually a very striking and kind of a very pretty and, and a geometrically unique spider on the abdomen. So to identify your widow spiders, they are black or in the case of the brown widow, they're brown. They are shiny and they're not, they are not hairy. So they, they are extremely non-hairy to the point that when you shine a flashlight or even just see them, they are very, they look very smooth and shiny. They have a very large abdomen in relation to their cephalothorax, so they have this big button, kind of a bulbous abdomen to them, and they always have that hourglass, that red hourglass on the underside of the abdomen. What's convenient is that she or he will hang upside down in that webbing, so it's really easy to see the underside of the abdomen all the time. Only the females are venomous, and contrary to popular belief and their common name, they rarely eat the male after they mate with them. This happens a lot of time in the lab or in a close situation where the male can't get away, but in nature, he generally gets away from the female before she has the ability to consume him. The general life cycle of widow spiders is that they start to mate in the spring and during the summertime. And probably by fall time, most of the species, like right now, the females are dying off because they've already laid, they've made it, they've laid their eggs, they've completed their life cycle. They will lay up to 400 eggs in their egg sac, and they keep this egg sac with them in their web, and they will move it around to protect it also. Uh, the spiderlings, when they emerge, will disperse by ballooning, so they'll shoot silk out of their spinnerets and they allow the wind to move them. So this is one reason why widow spiders are found throughout, there are species of widow spiders found pretty much throughout most of the United States. They are not just localized in pockets like you see recluse spiders. So they are able to spread very easily and because they, they move by ballooning, they're generally found more likely outdoors than they are inside. And populations due to the ballooning, because they get up and get out of there, are usually much smaller than recluse spider populations. The widow spider's bite is a neurotoxin. So the venom is a neurotoxin, and it has been said that it is 15 times more deadly than a rattlesnake venom, but a spider is very small, and you get a very minute amount of venom compared to the amount of venom you get from a rattlesnake. So the chance of it being deadly is um, very, very rare, in addition to that, it's not very well documented. So there are probably very, very few cases in the United States. The severity is very similar to the brown recluse. Severity really depends on the location of where you were bitten, the individual person, your allergy level, your overall health, and the amount of venom that was injected into that spot. That venom being a neurotoxin will act on the nervous system and it is able to travel through the bloodstream as opposed to a recluse bite, which pretty much stays in the tissue. Generally, you will start to feel large muscle pain 
And so you'll feel large pain. You'll feel pain in your abdomen, in your back, maybe in your legs, but large, long muscles. You have a hard time breathing. Your heart might be racing. It's affecting your nervous system. There is a, an urban legend I have heard that you have to get to the hospital within five minutes or you'll die. And that's not the case. You may not need to go to the hospital. It may not affect you that bad, but you will know if something is not right. You have a hard time breathing. You don't feel right. Your heart is racing out of control. You will have some clues that you need to go get medical assistance before it becomes a very serious medical issue. The widow spiders spend most of their time in their web and they use that web to catch their food. So this is great news as far as control of these guys, because that means you only really need to target and figure out where those webs are. If that's where they hang out, then you know that they're going to be there. They really prefer undisturbed, cluttered places, very similar to recluse spiders. They're more likely to be found outdoors or in outdoor structures. So you'll find them in sheds, garages, basements, crawl spaces. You may find them in closets, but these are generally outdoor closets, outdoor storage sheds. They might be found under decks. They may be found um, under logs, in firewood, other cluttered type places with lots of debris outdoors. Indoors, it's an undisturbed and quiet place. So it might be an abandoned barn or even an unabandoned barn. It's a barn that's not cleaned out very well. They are found in seldom used storage sheds or sections of the garage that aren't used very well or even in the basement or the attic. Control of these guys really is targeting the web. That's where they spend most of their time. And so if you can apply pesticides to the web, then you can apply pesticides almost directly to the widow spiders. If you can do inspections at night, if that's possible, that's better because that's when they tend to be a little bit more active. They're more likely to scuttle away from you during the day if you encounter them during the day. And so you don't necessarily know if they're in that web or not. Try to eliminate hiding places. They like cardboard boxes. They like old clothes. They like lumber, debris, clutter. They like um, old skull bones. They like places that have nice voids that they can hide and tuck themselves away in. Vacuum regularly, you're doing a couple different things. You're, you're vacuuming up their webbing, you're vacuuming up in the webbing, hopefully their egg sacs, and you're also vacuuming up their food sources, which are other insects. In control of these guys, it's very important to do outdoor control if that's what, if they are coming into the house. So that's where the majority of spiders are found. Now, just because you find a brown recluse somewhere outside or a widow spider outside, does that mean that you have to do some sort of control? Not necessarily, just make sure that you're very careful at avoiding them in those areas. So remove bricks, move old firewood away from the house. Don't uh, remove and don't pile up tin sheets. Don't stack lumber close to the house. Very, very dense plant growth. Try to thin that out a little bit. They love to hide in water meter covers, electrical boxes, and they also really like to hide in covers for boats, um, jet skis, that kind of thing, cars that aren't used or removed very often. That's one place that I can almost always find a widow spider at somebody's lake house or somebody's garage where they have a cover over a, a, a car or a boat that's not used. There's generally a widow spider hiding in those folds there. So management of these guys really is going to rely a lot on pesticide use, but also managing those webs. So non-repellent dusts to the webs can be effective. And if you're going to use liquid sprays, try to use products that are petroleum-based versus water-based. And the reason for that is because water-based products are repelled on the egg sacs, but they are absorbed by the egg sacs if it's petroleum-based. So if you're utilizing a pest management company, Talk to them about that and see if they can work with their supplier to use the right product. Cyfluthrin, deltamethrin, bifenthrin, lambda cyhalothrin. These are those same thrins, the synthetic pyrethroids, which can be very effective against managing spiders. However, you notice that it's many of the same products and that's correct, but the location and how you apply is different for recluse versus widow spiders because recluse have no webbing. You have to find their harbored sites. Widow spiders, you target the webs. Here's just some examples of pesticides that are labeled for spiders. I'll leave this up here for just a second or you can hit pause 
in case you need to write some of these products down. Most of these products um, you can get without a license. They're not restricted. However, you're not gonna find them at Lowe's or Home Depot or your garden store. You're gonna have to go through a supplier who may or may not require you to have a license to purchase through them. Thanks for joining us for this week's weekly webinar. Hope you learned a little bit about venomous spiders and what to do if you encounter them. Hopefully you're not as afraid of them as you were prior to this. It's good to know that we only have two types of venomous spiders in Texas. There are many more venomous other animals beyond spiders, so I say don't worry about them too much and enjoy the spiders that are in your landscape. Be sure to check out our other webinars on this YouTube channel, My Extension 210. And join us for live weekly webinars every Wednesday at noon.